Let's look at the Scope panel in Affinity Photo. This panel is not shown by default, but we can easily enable it by going to Window, Scope. I'll just drag the panel out to float it, so I can better demonstrate what each scope model does. We start off with the Intensity Waveform model here. It is currently empty, so I will add a fill layer to this document, which populates with full white by default. We can now observe a line at the very top. Across on the color panel, I'll change the format to grayscale and reduce the slider to 50. Notice the line has now dropped to the halfway mark where 50 is. So this intensity waveform displays the weighted intensity of your document, with 0 being pure black and 100 being pure white. To show this with a practical example, this composition has a strong concentration of bright tones, and we can see an abstract spatial representation of this on the intensity waveform. This can often prove more useful than a histogram because we are seeing a visual indication of where the more intense tones are, whereas a histogram will only indicate to us the distribution of tones. If I hide the Planet 1 layer, we can observe a very obvious change in the waveform here. I could also hide the Planet 2 layer, and now we are just left with this intense peak, which correlates to the sun on the image here. I'll just show both planet layers, and the two peaks in the waveform will return. Now let's look at the RGB waveform. The RGB waveform breaks down the contribution of the red, green and blue colour channels, so they can be analysed individually. We still get the abstract representation of tones in our image, but now we can see the RGB overlap. If I add an HSL adjustment, then desaturate the image, we will gradually see the coloured waves converge to weighted grayscale intensity waves. Next, we have the RGB parade. Rather than display the colour channels in an overlapping fashion, the RGB parade displays them individually, side by side. This is quite useful for observing the balance between the three channels especially for colour grading. For example, I might add a curves adjustment and target the individual colour channels. The red channel is quite dominant in this image, so let's see what it would look like if we tried to balance it out with the green and blue channels. I'll add a node on the green channel graph and push the tones up. Then I'll do the same with the blue channel. This has an interesting look and has helped to slightly balance out that red colour bias. From a creative standpoint, however, the original look is perhaps preferable, but I could blend this curves adjustment in and perhaps leave the opacity at 50%. Now we come to an interesting scope model. Power Spectral Density provides a representation of your document or image in the frequency domain. Within an image editing context, one use for this is analysing the sharpness or noise of an image. Here is a macro image comprised of several focus bracketed exposures that have been merged together for a shot with a large amount of fine detail. This is immediately apparent by the high frequency distribution on the power spectral density graph. Now if I were to add a live Gaussian blur layer, and bring the radius value up gradually, much of the information starts to disappear. Now, although this scope is very much for esoteric purposes, we might use it when trying to optimize our images for compression efficiency. The sheer amount of high frequency detail in this image will make it harder to compress to a lossy format such as JPEG. So we could use a small Gaussian blur value to soften it slightly, and even a value of 0.5 pixels makes an appreciable difference on the power spectral density representation here. The graph will also point out obvious colour casts. Here, for example, there is a lot of magenta star detail, and this bias is clearly reflected in the graph. Zooming in, there is also 
some chrominance noise. I can add a live noise reduction layer and begin to remove this, which will have a small effect on the graph. Furthermore, I could add an HSL adjustment at the top of the layer stack, target the magenta tones and start to desaturate them, which is reflected in the power spectral density readout here. Finally, we have the vector scope. This provides an insight into the balance and distribution of colors in our image. The colors are represented around this circular shape, with red near the top. Then as we sweep around, we have magenta, blue, cyan, green, and yellow. We then also have the eye line, which is known as the skin tone line. I can crop into a portion of this image to analyze the skin tones. Generally speaking, manipulating the tones so they sit close to the eye line is a good approach for ensuring accurate skin tone rendering. This can be achieved a number of ways, but one approach is to use an HSL shift adjustment. I can then switch across to target the yellows, but use the picker and click somewhere on the model's cheek here to sample the color range that we want to affect. Now I can move the hue shift slider by very small amounts and observe the cluster of tones move closer towards the eye line. Saturation is also represented by the distance towards the outer section of the scope. And you can see this clearly if I increase the saturation. Generally, we want to suppress the tones slightly to avoid them looking too unnatural. For this, I think I'll settle on a hue shift of six degrees and reduce the saturation to around minus 15%. Once I've moved the tones closer to the eye line, I can go to Document, Unclip Canvas to uncrop the document and reveal the whole image. Then I can preview the skin tone correction by hiding and then showing the HSL shift adjustment layer. Anyway, that was a look at the scope panel and how the various scope models can be used for analytical and corrective purposes when editing images. I hope you found the video useful and thank you for watching.